Mediterranean. She's excavated on the islands of Crete, Cyprus, and in Greece, and also in Egypt. She began her career at the University of Wisconsin, where she received a BA in archaeology and anthropology in 1972. She and I were office mates at the University of Minnesota during the 1970s, where she pursued the program in ancient studies, and I pursued literary matters, and also worried about our classes and our students and whether we would ever get jobs. Um, Julie has done some very, very important work on uh, the plant remains and the history of botanical remains in the Eastern Mediterranean. Did most of her work um, at the beginning of her career at Frankthi Cave in Greece and has completed a work on the paleoethnobotany of Frankthi Cave. She's now engaged in a second book project called The Archaeology of Plants, which is a larger work. I think that's all I'd like to say by way of preamble, except that everyone on this side of the room will probably enjoy what they see more if they move to the I other side. They, they don't want to move. They want to stay. OK. After much ado, we're ready to start. If I don't trip over a cord now. I am delighted to be here to address this diverse uh, group of people, and uh, very grateful to Madeline and the others who have worked so hard over the past, Madeline and I started talking about this about two years ago, so it's been a long time in coming. Um, I'm also very delighted, I have to say, to be back in the Midwest where I grew up and went to school. Um, the East Coast has nothing on the Midwest as far as I'm concerned, except fresh fish, but never mind. <laughs> Tonight I want to talk to you about the origins of agriculture in the Eastern Mediterranean, primarily in the Near East, um, principally the Near Eastern area I'm going to be talking about is the Levant uh, up here, Israel, Jordan, Syria, um, primarily. I will mention some of the um, areas in Eastern Iraq in the Zagros Mountains as well, um, but the, the most important area for the origins of cereal and legume agriculture, which is really the subject of my talk, is right along this area up in the, the Tauros Mountains here between uh, in, in southern Turkey, northern Syria, and along the Levantine coast here, the Jordan, Rift Valley, etc. Okay. Now, most people, when I tell them I'm a paleoethnobotanist, sort of give me a blank stare and change the subject. Um, so I'd like to first of all start by telling you a little bit about what it is I do and how we study the problems like the origins of agriculture uh, in the discipline of archaeology, which is really a, a multidisciplinary discipline now. Um, plant remains uh, are preserved on archaeological sites in a number of different ways. The principal material that I deal with, the principal kind of preservation in this part of the world is by carbonization. The plant remains principally seeds, um, wood, and other very dense parts of the plants have been burned to the point where they haven't turned to ash, they're not completely burned, but they've turned to little lumps of carbon primarily, and just like little pieces of charcoal. If the burning process is um, not too severe, not too rapid, the seeds will not be too badly distorted, so you can identify a wheat seed as a wheat seed or a barley seed as a barley seed. And anybody in here who's ever looked at wheat and barley seeds, and I imagine there must be some of you in here from this campus, um, will know that there is a difference. There's a morphological difference between the two. They, they actually do have different shapes, different sizes, different characteristics. Okay, so when I collect this material from an archaeological site, and we do this by dumping the dirt that we excavate into water. The carbonized material floats on the surface of the water, and we can collect it in, in large quantities if the, it happens to be there in large quantities. And uh, once it's dried, I sort through it with a microscope. And I compare the seeds that I find and the wood charcoal that I find with modern comparative material, modern examples of these different species that we're finding in order to identify them. We can't always identify everything to the species level. I should emphasize that. Um, 
we're getting better and better at it with more and more um, different kinds of techniques. We're getting into chemical techniques, which I will briefly mention tonight, um, to distinguish one species from another. We use scanning electron microscopes in some cases to look at minute details, little tiny bumps and things on the surface of the seeds uh, to help us identify them to the species level. Um, more often than not, however, there's enough distortion or enough significant parts of the plant are missing and very often plants are identified by their flowers and their leaves as opposed to their seeds that at a species level it, it might be very difficult or impossible to identify some of these little black blobs as I will show you tonight. They're not pretty things. We're not talking about gold and pretty pots. Uh, we're talking about little black blobs basically. Um, to me they're beautiful and beauty is in the eye of the beholder and I hope to, to instill a little bit of interest in you tonight uh, in this kind of topic and give you a little bit of insight into how archaeologists and botanists have been working together over the years to solve one of, uh, one of the greatest um, events really uh, or processes perhaps is a more appropriate word uh, in human history and that's the origins of agriculture. So to start out, could I have the lights please, Madeline? To start out we have, as you know, have been staring at these for five minutes, you know what these are. Uh, we have the, um, the geography of the, of, of the Near East here, Turkey um, and the Levant. Um, the Tauros Mountains here are important. Mountain ranges along the Levantine coast, uh, as you will see, become important in the process, uh, in the ecology of these plants. Uh, and as we get further south here now, we get into the Negev Desert, the Sinai, etc. The slide on your uh, left here, on your right, beg your pardon, is um, a uh, depiction of the modern vegetational zones in this area. Uh, and I put this up here just to give you an idea of the complexity of the vegetational zones in this part of the world. It's important, obviously, if we're going to study plants and the development of plants and changes in plants, we need to know something of their habitats, their ecology. Um, and it's a difficult problem in this part of the world, first of all, just because of its vastness in area, but also because of the mountain ranges, um, the large, vast plains, uh, high plateaus, etc. It provides a very diverse um, kind of topography for the different plant, uh, plant life there. So in order to, this is the modern vegetation which we can look at today and it's, it's there, we go out there and we say okay this is what is growing here, this is a steppe, this is a desert, this is a forest, um, and identify the plants. But we want to now translate this back into prehistory, okay? And I want to talk to you a little bit about how that is done as well tonight because it becomes important in understanding how we know about uh, where the plants existed that were ultimately um, One other little bit of preamble here, uh, definitions. It's very important to understand what I mean by domesticated versus wild plants. Uh, the species I'm going to be talking about tonight, um, domesticated wheat and barley and various legumes um, are domesticated because they have undergone a genetic change. Um, oftentimes this is only a single point on a chromosome that mutates uh, it, and causes the dispersal mechanism of the wild plant to change so that the plant can't disperse its seeds when it's ripe. Wild plants have this ability, obviously, or, or they would never be able to, to propagate. Um, domesticated plants, by definition, have lost this property. They need human intervention, someone to take the seeds and stick them into the ground because the plants, for the most part, can't do that themselves. And the genetic changes that um, plants have undergone are what the botanists have been studying for uh, a long time now. And um, in addition to the changes in the dispersal mechanism, there are also certain morphological changes in the seeds themselves that take place which allow us to distinguish then a seed of a wild wheat, for example, from the seed of a, of a domesticated wheat. Okay. Um, there are other parts of the plants as well that we study. I, I, I don't want to get into too much detail on that tonight. Um, 
what I'm mainly interested in is conveying to you the, the cooperation that has been going on over the years between archaeologists and botanists in studying this, um, this problem. Um, the whole uh, problem of the origins of agriculture has been discussed for um, about 150 years now um, by, by botanists primarily in the early years, um, including um, uh, De Candolle from, from France, who published treatises back in the 1850s, um, uh, Nikolai Vavilov, a Russian um, botanist, um, did a, a tremendous study looking at where the wild species of plants that were ultimately domesticated exist naturally or existed during his time. They still exist in some cases in these areas today. Uh, and he identified um, in a, in a um, treatise he, he published in the early 20th century um, for the Near East, the plants, wheat, barley, lentils, etc. He identified the Near East in general, this part of the Near East, as a center for domestication. Okay, this is the early 20th century we're talking about here. Um, but his studies of the ecology of these plants, the habitats of these wild predecessors that still can be found in these areas today, uh, led him to conclude and others to agree with him that, that this was one of the centers for domestication. Um, there are other centers around the world for other plants, obviously. Um, plants like corn um, or tomatoes domesticated in the New World, um, rice, uh, et cetera, dom domesticated in the Far East. So um, domestication of plants, this whole process, didn't take place just once and then spread out from, from a center. It took place in a number of different places around the world with different plants um, and may have spread from those centers out uh, in, a, in a smaller region. So we've been studying this, plant, this problem of the origins of agriculture, botanists looking at what the progenitors were of these wild, of these domesticated plants um, and where they existed um, since, since the middle of the 19th century. Archaeologists began to address this question as well early in the 20th century um, with, um, let's see if I can see these work. Hang on a minute. Um, people like um, V. Gordon Child, as you see here, with his teddy bear, um, who, who is best known for um, promoting an idea, which in fact was not his own, but had already been published earlier by someone else, the idea that agriculture began at the end of the last ice age, at the end of the Pleistocene, uh, as a result of uh, a drought that, that the, um, the, the earth, the, the rainfall decreased to such an extent that there was a massive drought in um, Southwest Asia. And this resulted in people congregating around water holes and oases. It's, it's commonly known as the oasis theory. Um, and that the, the, the juxtaposition of the people the wild plants and wild animals um, resulted in people becoming more, more familiar with the way these animals and plants um, reproduced and ultimately tamed the animals, bred the animals, domesticated them, and domesticated the plants as well. This is the oasis theory or propinquity theory that became quite popular um, uh, in archaeology uh, and was, was sort of a, a an accepted theory for, for many, many years. And um, with, agri with archaeological research in the Near East that was taking place early on with, with a number of sites like Ur, which unfortunately isn't on this map, but it's right down here, um, and various other sites like Jericho, for example, uh, being excavated, where they were finding early Neolithic occupation, um, very early civilizations, earlier than had been found before, um, it would it began to appear as if child might have been right. They didn't have the environmental data to go along with this. The archaeologists were, were merely excavating sites and, and building up pictures of cultures. But it appeared that there were some significant things going on here. Um, in, in the Near East in, in the early Neolithic period, about 8,000 
years or so ago. Okay. Um, in the 1950s and 60s, um, archaeologists from the University of Chicago, uh, Robert Braidwood uh, leading them, went off to actually test this theory, this oasis theory, to find out if in fact it was true. And this really began the intensive research into the origins of agriculture in the Near East, uh, bringing together archaeology and, and botany. Um, Braidwood went off to the Zagros Mountains here and excavated a number of sites, the important one being here at Ali Kash, uh, a cave site that uh, had uh, a number of layers of occupation. Um, this is the area that he was, uh, he was digging in. This is the Zagros Mountains here, and the foothills of these mountains is where, uh, where the site of Ali Kash is. Okay, it's ab above the, um, the plain of, uh, of the Euphrates and the Tigris River. Um, what Braidwood discovered at Ali Kash was, in fact, that there were domesticated wheat and barley there, emmer wheat and um, two-row barley, and domesticated animals, domesticated sheep and goat, um, fairly early on. The dates he was getting from this site were about um, 9,000 years ago, between 9,000 and 8,500 years ago. Uh, and this was a significant find. But in addition to finding the plants and animals on these sites, he brought along um, pa palynologists, people who study um, environmental change through looking at the changes in pollen sequences through time by doing cores and uh, in lake beds, etc., and building up a picture of changes in vegetation through time. And um, amongst the, the palynologists that went out here are various people from the Netherlands, Willem van Zeist, etc., um, Herb Wright from the University of Minnesota. Um, various people had, have done um, pollen studies in this area uh, over the years. And it's primarily as a direct result of, of Braidwood's initial work here that um, we have as much pollen study done. This one doesn't work. As we, as we do. This is a pollen core that was done up in the Z uh, Zagros Mountains. Uh, and this is, this is what it looks like when it's all done. This is, these are the data that they, that they produce. And each one of these columns here, this very wide one here and all of these little narrow ones, represent changes in the percentage of pollen of particular species of trees through time. Starting down here, the date down here is about 21,000 years ago. And the date up at the top, this would be the modern level, the most recent pollen deposited in this particular lake bed. Okay, And so this diagram here represents changes in the percentage of oak trees in the region. Um, from almost no oak, this is at the end of the last ice age, conditions being very cold, very dry, uh, unfavorable for the growth of trees. Um, the end of the ice age, uh, right about here, and warmer, wetter conditions and expansion of oak forest in the Zagros Mountains. Okay. Um, another important part of this diagram is this one over here, which represents the non-woody plants, the non-arboreal plants, grasses, and other herbaceous vegetation. And we can see that in the late Pleistocene here, at the end of the last ice age, we have um, predominance of herbaceous vegetation plants adapted to these very cold, dry conditions. Um, and then as, as the temperatures warm up, as rainfall increases, the, these plants retreat uh, as the forest expands. Okay, so there's a, obviously a connection between these two things and all connected with environment. So it's these kinds of studies, these pollen studies by the botanists, palynologists, coinciding with, uh, coming along with the studies by archaeologists in these areas that ultimately resulted in the kinds of answers we now have to the question of when and where and how and why did agriculture first begin. And that, uh, to make a long story short, is what I want to talk to you about tonight. Um, now, in, in all of these pollen diagrams, this one is not working. There we go. Okay. Um, 
the pollen diagrams like the one that I just showed you and all of the other ones that were on the previous, uh, the previous map, um, the palynologists have been able to put together rough, and these are very rough, uh, vegetation maps of the region through time. This is one dated to the very end of the Pleistocene, the very end of the, of the glacial period, where we have um, predominance of what is called forest steppe or steppe along the coast and up uh, around the Anatolian Plateau. This is open forest and um, with few trees and, and mostly herbaceous vegetation. Um, and a lot of area, for those areas where we have pollen data, um, of predominantly just steppe or, or in the south here, um, desert or desert steppe. Okay, so um, a, a relatively um, sparse vegetation in, in this part, especially in the Levant here, we have a little bit of, of forested area in the southern Levant at this time, but mostly it's, it's very open forest at most, and that would be up in the mountains where, we, where the rainfall was greater, um, and then forest steppe and, uh, and steppe in this area. This is the area we're going to be talking about primarily for, for the rest of the evening. Uh, we don't have many pollen diagrams any pollen diagrams for this particular area here in northern Syria, except one from right over about here. Uh, and it should be noted that pollen data is, is regional, but only regional within uh, a, a hundred kilometers or so around the area where the pollen was taken from. So we can't expand these kind of data to, a, to, to say, well, all of the Near East look like this. It's only um, those areas around the sites where the pollen was, was recovered. Okay, I'm going to try to remember which slide is which here. Nope, that was wrong one. I had a 50-50 chance. Okay, um, what archaeologists then, working, continuing to work in this area, have discovered is that in addition to the early Neolithic sites with early um, domesticated plants, beneath those sites are layers that contain pre-Neolithic occupation. And um, studies done, surveys now that have been carried out throughout the Levant um, have shown that, that the amount of pre-Neolithic occupation in this area, the period covering roughly 12,000 to 11,000 years ago, um, 12,000 to, to 10,000 years ago actually, um, was a period of fairly dense habitation in this part of the world when the forests were beginning to expand at the, at the end of the Pleistocene, um, it was getting warmer and wetter. The um, deer population, gazelle populations that lived in these environments were expanding and populations were expanding as well. All of the botanical resources these people could exploit were expanding with the expansion of the forest. Um, amongst the sites where we see this kind of progression, um, an expansion is the site of Jericho here. Here is the mound, uh, the south side of the mound of Jericho uh, here with a big excavation trench in it. This was done by Kathleen Kenyon back in the, in the 50s here. And um, Jericho, of course, is a site that was occupied for thousands of years, which is why we have this great buildup of sediment here. The lowest layers, amongst the lowest layers, we have this kind of deposit here. These are Mesolithic layers, pre-Neolithic layers, layers deposited, living floors deposited by people who were hunters and gatherers, hunting wild animals, primarily gazelle in this area, and collecting wild plants. Um, at Jericho, in particular, we don't have any wild plants preserved in these levels, unfortunately, but we do have other sites uh, dated to the same time period where we do have um, plant remains. In addition to plant remains, and I'll talk about those in a second, we also have the, um, the tools that people used to process those plant remains, which gives us a little bit of a clue as to, um, as to what they might have been using. Uh, tools like this, big grinding stones, appear at this time in the Mesolithic. Um, these are typically used uh, and, ha and continue to be used right through the Neolithic and, and onward for grinding grain, making flour or or pounding grain to make uh, bulgur or couscous, that type of thing. Um, this is a husking tray 
here, um, actually a, a wooden one, which is preserved, carbonized, um, very unusual find, a scored bowl of wood, and they would put the grain in there and shake it around and, and husk it or, or thresh it um, to remove the husk. The wild grains have, have, are tightly enclosed in the husk, and uh, in the early domesticated form are tightly enclosed in the husk as well, so you, you need these kinds of processing tools. Uh, other kinds of tools, the most important ones here are, are things like this, long blades, especially these types of tools, which are um, called sickle blades uh, that were hafted onto handles. Uh, not, uh, this is not a, not a handle, but it might have looked like this, in fact, with a slit down one side and these blades stuck in there. Um, being stuck in with a bitumen uh, of some sort, uh, and those kinds of things that have actually been found on some sites, um, and used as a sickle to cut the grain. Okay. Uh, in other cases, the grain might have been beaten into baskets with a stick because the grain, the wild grain, comes off the head very easily as it ripens uh, and would have shattered into, into baskets quite easily. Okay, so these are some of the some of the tool types that we find at this pre-Neolithic. This is hunting and gathering period, and some of the plant remains we find are things like um, wild pistachio. This is a modern, growing wild pistachio plant, not to be confused with the domesticated pistachio nuts that they dye pink and cover with salt. Um, these are carbonized nutlets of wild pistachio. That's what they look like. Uh, these particular plants come from Francfi. I don't have examples from, from the Near East itself, but they're the same. They look the same. Um, and just to give you, uh, give you an example of what, what the difference is, and put, people always ask me, well, what do, what do wild pistachios look like? Um, there are modern pistachios. You're all familiar with those. These are the wild ones. Uh, they taste like turpentine. And uh, they're still used today. They're, you can buy bags of them roasted in the markets in Cyprus. And um, they, are, they are typically added to meat dishes, um, various different kinds of sausages, etc. So um, they are still utilized today. And the pistachio bush, the number of different species have different uses of, of various kinds. They, they produce a, a gummy substance, one of the species does, that is used as chewing gum or they use, use it to fill cavities, various things. It uh, has a wide variety of, it's all purpose plant. Um, so those are the, the wild pistachios. Um, uh, other kinds of plants that are found, and remember the forest is expanding here, we're getting more um, trees in here, wild pears. These again are from Francfi, but the same plants are found in the Near East. This is a whole carbonized wild pear here, and, and then the, the seeds of the plant as well have been found. And perhaps one of the more important plants along with the cereals are wild legumes, and lentils um, are amongst the earliest legumes uh, and the most predominant legumes that are, that are utilized by these people. And those are some examples. I told you these weren't pretty, okay? Um, but they're, uh, they're at least identifiable. Um, now, uh, this is an example of some of the cereals that have been found. These actually were found on a, on a Mesolithic site in the Near East, uh, the site of Abu Reira, which I will be mentioning a number of times tonight. It's probably the most important site so far excavated to talk about the origins of agriculture in the Near East because uh, of the quantity and quality of the plant remains preserved on this site from these Mesolithic levels and then subsequently from Neolithic levels. So we have uh, in one site both um, the wild and the domesticated plants showing up. These are, uh, or at least were initially identified as wild einkorn wheat, and one of the one of the primary species of wheat that was first domesticated. Um, and they're very common in um, Near Eastern sites where we have Mesolithic plant remains preserved. They're native to the area. Uh, most recently, um, the archaeologist Gordon Hillman from um, the Institute of Archaeology in London, who's been studying these plants, has gone together with chemists. We've had botanists coming together with archaeologists. We now have chemists coming together 
to um, help identify some of these seeds, which he was not sure were einkorn. And he thought maybe they were wild rye, because he has domesticated rye in the Neolithic levels. And yet he hadn't found many grains of wild rye in the Mesolithic levels. So they, they discovered that you could take a single grain of, the, of this material here, one of these grains, and process it and remove uh, vestiges of the fatty acids that are preserved. Even a carbonized seed that's 10,000 years old, there's enough remains of fatty acids in there that they could analyze those and identify the, the type of fatty acid, the quantity of the different types of fatty acid in it, and identify that to a particular species of wheat, in this case, or rye. Okay, and this is the kind of graph they would get out. They did this with a technique called uh, infrared spectroscopy. You don't need to remember that. There won't be a quiz. Um, but they, they ended up with a graph, graphs like these. These are modern um, seeds of uh, wild rye here. And this is the graph for the, for the seeds from the site of Alvareira. And they're, they're virtually the same. Okay, the graphs for the einkorn are quite different. I don't have any half pictures of those, take my word for it. They are quite different. Um, and uh, from a, a nearby site uh, that is um, a slightly later site uh, near Abu Reira, we have um, domesticated, um, a, uh, not, this is not domesticated, but a different species of wild rye. Here's that um, species here. Uh, the modern graph, and here's the, the, the graph from the ancient species. So even, um, even minute traces of, uh, of chemicals um, in these seeds can, are now being analyzed, and this is a process that we could use for, for all of those problem seeds where we can't tell one species from another, and there are many of those. Okay. Um, this is just an example here of the... Um, the wild rye plant that would have been growing um, in the area uh, today. This right here. And just to, to clue you into what the sites I'm talking about, Abu Reira is there in northern Syria, right on the Euphrates River. Um, the other side of Morabit uh, is right there. Uh, Abu Reira dates from about 11,000 to um, 10,000 BC. B P in these early, uh, uh, early levels, Mesolithic levels, um, to orient you. Jericho is down there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Important sites during this period, um, Mesolithic period, spread throughout this whole area, even down into, into the south, into the Negev Desert, um, in the Mesolithic period. So there was uh, intensive occupation, increase in population, and apparently sedentary occupation. And this is very important. It was an important step in the process of the origins of agriculture that these people moved from being mobile, small bands of hunters and gatherers, um, following herds of gazelle, perhaps, um, and collecting wild plants where they could find them, as they must have done throughout the Pleistocene. Um, to this period when we're getting uh, warmer, wetter conditions, increasing um, forested areas and more lush vegetation, increase in these various wild resources, um, and an, an expansion of, of population in settled communities building houses and staying in the same place year round. That process, this settling, settling down, um, eliminated to a large extent all of the different taboos that people tend to have when they're mobile populations, uh, which allowed them then to increase the population. All of the taboos that go along with um, keeping the population low and keeping a low birth, weight, birth rate were, um, were disbanded with because they, they were now in areas with good resources that they could exploit throughout the year, so they didn't have to be mobile anymore. So um, to give you an idea of the kinds of areas that these people were expanding into, um, let me just take you down the, down the Levant. We're moving down the, the Orontes Valley, which basically travels down here, and then down the Jordan Valley, down the Dead Sea, and into the, into the, Negev, uh, into the Negev Desert. Um, we have the Orontes uh, Valley up here in, um, 
in Lebanon. And it was this kind of area and the foothills of these areas where we were getting the expansion of this forest. Okay, so you just have to imagine that there's more plants there than you actually see. It's hard to imagine that in some of these pictures, of course, because there are no plants in some of these pictures today. Uh, obviously, these areas uh, have been heavily worked over, um, both by uh, farmers and herders, uh, intensively cultivating and, um, and then grazing their flocks in these areas. Um, and that, along with various climatic changes, et cetera, has resulted in in massive deforestation over the thousands of years since the end of the Pleistocene and, um, and massive erosion so that the hills that once held all of the sediment you see here um, now are bare or, or nearly bare. Um, and all of the sediment has eroded down, been carried down by the rivers and, and deposited on the floodplains. Okay, so here we are. Um, the southern um, Jordan Valley here, the, the Dead Sea, uh, the Dead Sea here, we're at the edge of the Dead Sea and moving down uh, south um, in, the, uh, in the Jordan Valley and onto the, into the Negev Desert, uh, where they can, with irrigation, just on the edge of the desert, they can uh, cultivate, but then we get into very barren um, sand dunes, wasteland scrub vegetation, steppic vegetation in, in some cases. Okay, now in order to trace the changes in this vegetation through time, as we get into this period when we first begin to see domesticated plants, we want to know what was going on with the vegetation. What, where were these plants and how was the climate and the environment changing and did that have an effect, as child had thought, did that have an effect on the process of domestication? And for a long time, um, as a result of, of the studies done by Braidwood's team in the Zagros Mountains and all of these other pollen diagram studies done in the Near East, it looked as if there wasn't a drought at the end of the Pleistocene. We didn't have this whole um, drying up and people gathering around oases and, and domesticating the plants and animals that were in the area. Um, so that theory was, was pretty much thrown out and archaeologists went after other types of theories. The whole idea of population expansion um, is one of those theories that they settled uh, permanently and population expanded to the extent that they, um, they overexploited the area that they had to exploit around their settlement and then were forced because of this overexploitation to artificially increase the plants that they had by deliberately cultivating them, assuming, of course, that they knew how to cultivate. They knew that you had to take the seed and stick it into the ground in order for you to get a new crop. Um, so population expansion, um, overpopulation it has been a, a prominent theory in the origins of agriculture for a long time. Uh, and various spin-offs and, and convolutions of that theory have been developed and disbanded over the years. Um, in, in most recent study, in the, a study that's been published only in the last year, um, new pollen data from Lake Hule, which is in, is in northern, uh, northern Jordan Valley, um, this is an old diagram, but a new diagram um, covering the same time period has shown that indeed there was probably a period of about a thousand years between 11,000 and 10,000 years ago when there was a period of drought. And we can just see this on this diagram right here. It may not look like much to you, but this is a period where we had, at the end of the Pleistocene, you get the expanding trees here. These are um, deciduous um, oak trees for the most part, expanding, increasing in quantity. And then we've got this little blip, we've got another little blip there, uh, with several little blips here. Uh, this represents probably uh, a period of drought. Um, it's difficult to say that from this diagram, I admit, but the other diagram, which I didn't have a copy of uh, to, to photograph, 
um, shows this much more clearly because it has a much dater, much better dated um, section right there. So between 11,000 and 10,000, we now have paleontological evidence for this part of, of the Near East that there probably was a drought. Now, the effect of that is seen in the plant remains from this site of Abu Reira that I have already mentioned. Um, prior to this period, the plants that they were getting were of these things like pistachios and pears and the various cereals that I've mentioned, along with a very wide variety of plants from not only the steppe, but the, but the, 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 river, um, the river vegetation and up into the foothills where you get forest and, and forest steppe areas with a, quite a diverse uh, number of plants. Um, with, um, with this drought, at this period in time on this site, a lot of those pistachios and, and pears and a lot of that woody vegetation that they had been exploiting uh, decreases and all the steppic species, species that they were exploiting, the species that grow in drier conditions, um, begin to increase. And this goes along with this kind of pollen data. Uh, and in the gob, the pollen diagram from up near the site of Abu Reis, this is about 150 kilometers away from the site itself, we have um, this period right in here. Okay, here we have the end of the Pleistocene uh, with increasing trees, and then we have this sharp decrease right here. Okay, and that represents a period of time when we have this drought. Okay, I think I pointed the wrong one. It's right here, sorry. This <coughs> increase in trees, zone Z, is what they are, are equating with this period from about 1,000 years, 11,000 to 10,000 years ago, when we have this drought. Um, so we have, we have data both from the pollen evidence and from the plant remains from the archaeological site that begin to corroborate one another and also then begin to corroborate um, the original idea that there was a drought at the end of the Pleistocene that, that might have resulted in the domestication of plants. Um, now the effect of this drought would have been an increase in this kind of vegetation. Not these vegetation, but this vegetation. Um, steppic vegetation. This is, this is pretty degraded step here. This is almost desert. Um, but very uh, low growing, scrubby vegetation, a little lusher than this. Um, expanded now at this period. And so the, 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 the number of trees uh, available and the resources in these forests that they had been exploiting disappeared. Um, it's, it's as these step and, and, and forest step areas expand, this drier vegetation area expands and the deciduous forest decreases that we, we begin to see the change. First of all, remember we had sedentary populations um, and expanding populations at this time. Every site that has this Mesolithic occupation is abandoned at this period of time. Okay, I don't, we don't know where they went. Um, we're still looking for those sites that have people in them at this point in time. Um, but all of these sites were, were abandoned at the end of this, uh, of this period for uh, several hundred years. All right, not a very long period of time. And then they were reoccupied. Jericho was abandoned. Abu Reira was abandoned. Several of the other big sites um, that we see at this time period were abandoned. And when they're reoccupied, they have domesticated plants. So they went off someplace and domesticated plants and then came back with them. And we're still wondering quite where, where would they have gone? Well, one way to figure out where they would have gone is to follow where the forest went and where the, the ecotone between the forest step and the step went. Where did that move to? Because that's where these plants, the domesticated plants, or the wild progenitors of the domesticated plants would have gone. Okay, um, just to run through very briefly the kinds of plants that were domesticated, this is um, wild einkorn wheat here, one of, the, one of the primary wheat species that was domesticated. This is uh, what the domesticated uh, einkorn wheat looks like. The shape of the seed is different. I don't know if you can see that uh, from, from where you're sitting, but um, there, there's a distinct difference in, in the shape of the seed, so we can tell when we have domesticated. Um, species. Um, now, where were those plants? Well, this is the natural 
modern distribution of wild einkorn, um, predominantly in this area here, okay, um, on the Anatolian Plateau, um, around the foothills of the Zagros and the Tauros Mountains, and then vestiges of them today uh, are represented by all these dots. These may be um, sagittal habitats. Uh, they may not be actually um, areas where the plant was native, but has, has since has been introduced, um, perhaps in prehistoric times, but may not be part of their natural distribution. Okay, so this is one area where we have um, the the wild plant existing in modern times. Um, their distribution in ancient times may have been broader than this. We have to remember the amount of of um, environmental destruction that has gone on over the years. So um, we're not looking at its maximum extent necessarily. Okay, um, but that that arc, that Zagros Toros arc, becomes important. Here's the um, wild rye slash einkorn from Abureira that I mentioned before, and these are the domesticated seeds that show up in the site. Uh, in the Neolithic period, just to give you an idea of the difference. Which, what we see as paleoethnobotanists, this is what we're looking at, and the difference in these two. Okay. Um, I don't know if that's not that one. 